Welcome back to the Unreal Podcast. Uh, this time it's just me. None of the other hosts are on. Uh, this is James Craig, a contributor to the recently released Tales of the Unreal, which uh, is why I'm here today. I'll be reading The QE by Ogden Nesmer, one of the last entries in the uh, anthology, which you can check out on Amazon or our website. <clears throat> The wind drives a sharp cold, barreling up the slopes as fast as a boulder might tumble down, bending the blades of grass and tattered shrubs towards the same subject like reverent onlookers. All pointing to the ridge, all crusted with frost and locked in accusation at an empty edge and vacuum beyond, standing there, looking straight into the roar and trying to assemble the village below from the golden pinpoints that shimmer through the murk, it feels as if you've been placed in a way of impending punishment. Someone is coming to get you. Melder marks this down in his log, the small one, for personal notes, not to be produced at the end of the assignment. It's lonely, he writes, but it feels crowded, too. His pants are tucked into his socks, but the cold air still finds a way to slip up past his ankles, his knees, his crotch, chilling him under his thick coat. He scratches three thick lines over his entry. The measurements for the day are filed, the 22-kilometer hike between vantage points completed. Dobrik is down there already, nursing a whiskey and keeping a seat free but Milner has to put something down, lest he should forget. The days would be lost if not for vigilant observation. The vibrations of a foghorn, inaudible under the sustained blast of frigid air, resonate in Milner's chest. It's the boat, invisible but unmistakable. He jots two words, oxbow back, then scoots uneasily into the misty flow, looking away as he stumbles with care, trying to keep the ice out of his eyes. A block away from the harbor and the boat phases into view. Its main deck is still too high to see from the cobblestone street, but Melner can hear a crew laughing and cursing, the only human sounds to be heard in the otherwise empty streets. Inside the tavern, Dobrik and Oxbrow are already conversing. They speak low, but it doesn't matter. Sailors and locals, equally drunk and raucous, nothing can be heard in the bar this soon after a landing, unless someone's shouting it in your face. But Oxbow is calm, and Dobrik is listening politely, both of them grinning. Melner walks past them and sits at the bar, waiting for his turn. Oxbow is the code name. He told Melner and Dobrik this on the day he brought them to the bay, making it clear that although they were things being kept from them, their employers would be transparent in their obfuscation. That was a long time ago now, hard for Melner to remember how he felt about it then, but it set the tone for the entire expedition. They didn't know where they were stationed, they weren't to stray too far from their observation points to collect measurements, and the village was their only respite for shelter and essentials. Perpetual cloud coverage made determining location effectively impossible. Government jobs could be like this, enforcing a level of secrecy that seemed to precede any real goals. Neither of them spoke the language of the locals, and Melner wasn't sure, even sure what language it was. He couldn't say if Dobrik knew, as they didn't speak much when they shared a drink at the end of the day. They weren't allowed. They weren't even allowed to talk about their lives before the assignment. Melner didn't know what Dobrik's responsibilities were, and Dobrik never asked about his. Naturally, Oxbow's infrequent visits always involved a lot of precision misinformation, a mix of delaying, misrepresenting, and perfectly timed silences. And of course, every so often he had to feed them a little something to keep their hopes up. We're south, he confided one quiet night, either a little too drunk or just putting on an incredibly convincing act. What do you mean, Melner had asked, knowing damn well what Oxbow had meant, but hoping he could squeeze some more out of them. He couldn't. What he meant was that they had already been lied to. The mission to collect data from key points in a certain radius from the North Pole had been a front, and they were actually somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere, something Melner had been suspicious of since the first time he pulled his compass out. It felt good to hear his suspicions vindicated, but that was all Oxbow said, and then it was Dobrik's turn. Melner watches them through the mirror behind the bar and slips his gin. Sips his gin. Dobrik laughs at something likely unfunny. Dobrik is an excellent kiss-ass. He would thrive anywhere in any field so long as someone were above him. It's somewhat impressive, Melner can't deny, considering the brutal, unabating cold and the hours of enforced loneliness. Melner can barely muster a smile. He couldn't socialize if he wanted to, but, but Melner was convinced Dobrik didn't want to. He was that committed to his sycophancy. He smiles, stands up, and shakes Oxbow's large hand, turning to Melner to salute ironically before departing for... Wherever he slept, Melner didn't know. You'll have a drink, Oxbow asks. He has the same accent as the villagers. Melner jingles his half-full glass in the air and takes a seat. So what's new? Nothing good. Melner has come to expect this response. 
It will be followed by a brief list of not good things. For example, projects off schedule, money is running out, some nameless higher up is being transferred, etc. Of which, Oxbow will select one to enumerate upon. Drawing out the description to somewhere around 15 minutes, he will allow a follow-up question, which, naturally, must be confined to the appropriate, already proffered subject matter. Then respond vaguely for approximately 12 more minutes. He will then check the clock subtly and explain that unless there are no other issues, he needs to be back on the ship. And if there are other issues, you, you really ought to be sending all of these questions to the aforementioned nameless higher-ups, and also you knew about the classified nature of the assignment before you took it, and other such shit. But it's different this time. Oxbow leans back and speaks to the waitress in her there, language, asking for another drink, wasting precious minutes. He leans back in slowly. Say your goodbyes to Dobrik tonight. He will be gone by tomorrow morning. Milner can't speak, afraid to ask the wrong question, whose answer is classified and yields a quick departure. You don't have to tell me, Oxbow continues. I know you must be jealous. At least you know, Milner can't resist. But chin up, you are next. That perfectly timed glimmer of hope. Once we find someone to replace Dobrik, we'll come for you, so be happy. He swallows his drink in one gulp and leaves with a quick excuse. Not bothering to try and find Dobrik's dwelling for a feigned farewell, Melder makes his way home after a few more gins. By this hour, the wind is thick with slush, smears of white that crisscross the air and melt into gray sludge in the road. Melder heads to the broad boardwalk and travels the span of Oxbow's boat from bow to stern. The game plate must be drawn up. Melder can't find it. He kicks a pebble over the edge and into the water but doesn't hear it splash. At home, up the stairs of a creaking building that groans in protest, past the always locked doors of other boarders, Melner makes an entry in his personal log, leaving out the jealousy and the fear, the blind rage and visceral hatred of Dobrik, who in actuality was only mildly annoying. Keeping the entry as brief and factual as possible, ultimately just Dobrik leaving me next, hopefully, to save space on the paper. He throws the notebook down on a stack of already filled logs, his stomach sinking. Before he'd learned brevity, he was filling pages a day. The three full logs amounted to just a few months, within what he'd signed up for at the start. Milner tried to remind himself for the sake of his own sanity. He was not lost, not forgotten. Everything was moving along as planned. The village was so bleak and cold and isolating, it was making a bad thing unbearable. Milner would make it, and he'd have a few pages to spare. He remembers Dobrik asking him about the personal logs. He called them diaries. Can I read them sometime? Melder scoffed, but Dobrik was apparently serious. I won't judge, he assured. Finding himself surprisingly livid at the potential violation, Melder shook his head and tried to compose himself. First of all, no. Second, what is the point of a personal log if I go around sharing it with other people? I wouldn't know, you're the one keeping track of empty days. Consider it classified. Don't let Oxbow find out. What's that supposed to mean? Well, they sent us here for our observations. If you're logging observations, Oxbow will want to know. How is he going to find out? I don't know the substance of your conversations. No, but it sounds like you're describing to me the substance of yours. Excuse me? Can't you just leave me at my one pleasure on this shitty island? I wouldn't say this is your one pleasure, glancing hard at the drink rising to Milner's lips, and this isn't an island. Figure of speech, we're stuck here, trapped, a deserted island. Melder feigned and the conversation moved on, but as soon as the night was finished, he rushed home to make it his entry for the night. Not an island. As Oxbow had promised, Dobrik is not in the village the next morning. Although normally avoiding the encounter, Melder makes it a point to be in the tavern for coffee, where he knows Dobrik likes to start his day and find finds no Dobrik. He starts his daily trek and soon discovers he is whistling. He moves briskly, despite the wind splashing up over the ridge and threatening to send him careening into the muddy valley. The angelic smudge of the sun behind clouds feels uncharacteristically warm on his face. He feels some guilt, of course. Dobrik wasn't all that bad. Melner scolds himself, but his departure is a good omen. Me next, Melner repeats in his mind. Hidden in the fog, miles away from anyone in the village, Melner lets all his giddiness out in one triumphant explosion, jumping up and down and pounding his chest. Thinking of all the beautiful things he's lived without for so long, hot showers, electricity, sunlight, meals not centered around preserved fish, etc. He laughs maniacally. The sound is carried away and his energy is depleted. He is reminded he is cold. Finding himself at waypoint 4 of 6, Milner pulls out his log, non-personal, and scribbles two amounts for the last waypoints. He doesn't even know what these are for. Why the hell should he care anymore? He ducks it away and makes for the village. It'll be a celebration, he thinks, to Dobrik. He'll say to nobody and pour a little of his drink out on the dirty tavern floor. Melner stops at his room, not remembering why when he gets there. 
The door is locked and inside everything is where he left it, but the absence of the stack is felt immediately. He flips the nightstand and checks under the mattress and bed frame and between the cushions of the single chair, but they're gone. The window is locked and no one has a key to the door but him. All of his filled diaries are missing. No, he thinks, not missing. Stolen. How could they not be? That bastard Dobrik. Somehow he found out where Melner lives, or always knew, and he lifted them to hand off to Oxbow. It had to be the little rat. The cancerous, scum-filtering muck-dweller, spineless protozoan filth donning the skin of a pale, rat-faced, pig-fucking-ass-kisser. Melner bursts into the tavern as if Dobrik would be there waiting, but of course he isn't. It's barely occupied at this early hour, and the few drunks already dutifully sipping don't notice Melner. The boat is gone with no telling when it'll be back. Will Oxbow be angry? Will he even care? Hard to say, but the feeling that Melder is now untethered, freely floating in a directionless vapor, is inescapable. What day is it? How long has it been? He is already wondering. I need those logs back, Melder says aloud. No one says anything back. Oxbow must be brought back. For the first week, Melner stays up all night staring at the grave void where the horizon should be, and prays for Oxbow's boat. Feeling a phantom buzz from a foghorn not present, he tries to bridge the language barrier with the barmaids he's seen Oxbow flirt with, but receives only confused glares. So he starts breaking rules, shirking his responsibilities, and writing in fake measurements for his daily entries. Soon he stops entering them altogether. He drinks from morning to evening in the hopes that Oxbow or Oxbow's supervisors are keeping an eye on it of the expanding tab. Weeks go by without luck and Melner begins to fear the opposite, perhaps on reading the logs and seeing Melner's prompt disobedience. He simply abandoned him. He'll be stuck here. Where? Forever. Panicked, he stamps back into action. He is up early to spend extra time at each waypoint, making measurements across the span just in case it helps the project. He longs for an ass to kiss, marking off a few new waypoints deeper into the cyan valleys that span endless into the fog. The direction in which the wind is always pulled. Out here, the roaring of the wind being too loud to allow for the passage of sound reasoning. Melner begins to consider another way to summon Oxbow. Surely they wouldn't let him die out here, he thinks. Looking down the slope that becomes gravelly and jagged, the steeper it falls. Surely, if he were in actual real danger, the project supervisors would step in, right? The ground is muddy, and this made-up waypoint is hours from the village. Is anybody watching? They won't let him die, he promises, as the dirt under his feet crumbles away. Milder remembers another conversation with Dobrik. It's after the, the discovery of the diaries, during a period when Dobrik would offer his own experiences as contribution to Melner's personal logs some of which made it in, often about things the environment made him feel or reflect upon. Useless fluff, which Melner suspected was meant to mock him. Can you keep a secret? Dobrik sounded playful, signaling that the secret he was about to reveal was ultimately meaningless. Technically a secret, yet lacking the essential elements of any good secret. <clears throat> Melner mumbled. I stepped out of my research zone today. I was at my second waypoint, down the slope leading away from the village. There's a little tree-covered grotto. I've always noticed it, and today with the sun we had, sarcastic. I thought it was just looking too enticing to ignore. I slid down and had my lunch there, and from that angle, it's the most incredible thing. The mist caught by the wind shoots up like an inverted waterfall. What lights cames through at noon catches it and spreads its color. It really is amazing. I don't know what you call that phenomenon or if it's anything one can observe enough to give it a name. A silence. Anyway, Dobrik shrugged. It's nice to see a bit of beauty in this place. I thought there would be more before I came. Melner didn't move, but he felt like jumping up and grabbing Dobrik by the next, slamming his wooden skull against the table edge and breaking a bottle over his temple. Were we admitting it? Was it really coming out of his mouth without so much as a question from Melner that he had known where they were going, where they were, and he was just now slipping up and exposing himself? Privy to the machinations that defined their joint suffering and only just now feeling the urge to say so? Melner felt so triumphant he wanted to sob, but he sipped in silence and let Dobrik continue. It feels like so long ago, you know? I guess it's only been a few months, but I feel like a different person. Of course, how can you not? You feel different too? There's no other way to feel, considering we are nothing but a series of consistent responses to our environment. We react differently to different environments. But we have no environment here, really. Nothing to see, nothing to hear, can't talk, can't even reach out and touch anything without feeling identical, cold, wet, withering surfaces. Meaningless input. We're floating in space or stuck in a cocoon, it's impossible to tell. Does Oxbow know you feel this way? Why should he? Maybe he could help, give you something for those feelings of hopelessness. I don't need pills, damn it. I'm telling you this is how a rational person reacts to a situation like ours. I'm the one who's thinking straight. You're the one who needs a frontal lobotomy. Come on, Melner, this is textbook. I'm sure they have some cute names for this syndrome like island fever or maybe open space anxiety. 
Try to be calm and think about this for a minute. And try to be calm. Why don't you turn your brain on? Melner, sitting back down, kills his gin. In fact, kinophobia. Dobrik thinks aloud. That's the word Oxby used when he first approached me. I acted like I knew what it meant, but I had to look it up after he, he chuckles. Fear of the empty, the open, the blank. I'd say you've got a pretty bad... Melner? Melner is on him in a second, trembling and pulling his face close by the collar. Red-faced, he's slobbering and demanding to know everything all at once. When did you meet Oxbow? How do you know him? Who is he? What's his real name? All why Dobrik pleased and summons the staff for assistance. Slobbering and digging nails into Dobrik's skin, Melner is still shouting, questioning, cursing, as he's removed by two burly barkeeps. Dobrik is led out the back door while Melner is tossed out the front. After circling the building repeatedly for half an hour, he determines there is no back door, so he storms back inside and is removed again. He runs in the general direction he believes Dobrik lives, crying, asking simply, why now? Why, 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 why? No answer but the wind. Two days after the fall and Melner finds himself in a place he's never seen. The novelty is precious for a moment, but the odors of excreta and death and the familiar howl jostling at the window panes tells him he hasn't strayed far. Two planks are strapped to the sides of his calf and his arm is in a sling. A swollen seam runs up from his chin, spreading out like a spider web. Frayed loops of twine hold his skin together, black and crusted with scab. A quick wiggle and he can feel the scrapes, tears, and bruises decorating his body. A nurse brings in a metal tray and sets it by the bed. Melner cannot see its contents from supine on the bed, his leg elevated in a rickety framework. The nurse sits on the edge of his bed and puts a warm, calloused hand over his sutures. You had a fall. Her accent is slight. This is true? Where am I? You are in the hospital. Where am I? We have told your friend about your situation. My friend? Who? What's his name? Melner can feel her grip tighten. He is very concerned. Where are my logs? He has consulted with our physicians on your behalf, and she reaches for something on the tray. We've come to an agreement as to the necessary treatment. With his tattered leg, Melner pulls the framework down, crashing into the nurse's back. The pain of something freshly broken shoots further into his hip as he throws himself over and scrambles for the door, throwing the tray, the sheets, anything at the woman writhing on the floor. The wing is empty. The other beds have no sheets. He slams the door and catches the nurse's extended fingers. Her cries bring two male nurses out thundering down the hall with their thick shoulders scraping the walls. In a flash, Melner ejects himself towards the only light he can feel, sending his whole body tumbling through a pane of glass and out into the cold. He's made new cuts, warm blood running down his legs and torso, and the nurses inside are cursing at him in English. Melner makes for the hills as fast as his shattered limbs will allow. He's almost naked, the flimsy hospital gown flapping in the gale and trickling red all over the cobblestone. Soon he's crossed the village limits. If anyone is chasing him, he can't hear them and can't bear to turn around and check. Unevenly but hastily, he clambers up the grassy slope, digging the planks of his cast into the mud, seam popping halfway on his hands and knees, clawing at grass and mud. He clears the top and slides down the other end. He repeats. He repeats again. He's far from the village before the adrenaline is worn off, his wounds caked with dirt and grass. Numb from cold, something warm beats like a heart inside each of his fingers, fading fast. He stands erect, looking right into the wind. It screams at him. He screams back. It can't have him. Melner might die, but the wind can't have him. His voice breaks and he can't scream anymore. He's panting and starting to get cold. A figure reaches the ridge behind him. From this distance, they're small and Melner covers them with his thumb at arm's length, makes them go away. No one is following me. A gun cracks and the earth at Melner's feet sprays mud and rainwater. He falls backward and the gun cracks again. The figure is shouting, waving his arms, shooting. The gun cracks. Melner is scurrying up the hill and slides down the other side, farther away now from the village than he's ever been, slipping into a fog-filled basin. The gun cracks again, and a faint voice is yelling for Melner to stop. Stop, but he's sliding too fast. The fog doesn't abate. It gets thicker and thicker, and his leg twists the wrong way. He screams, and he's picking up speed. The gun's cracking is sucked away until it's lost somewhere in the abyss above him. Everything is soon lost, reduced to rhythmic, pounding on his numbed and twisted body. It's white with nothing, and the only thing stringing Melner to reality is the pain pouring up his leg, and until that, like everything, fades into nothing. So that was Vacui by Ogden Nesmer, with audio samples provided by an annoying dog in the background. My apologies. Now that, I will call a short horror story. I'm hoping that because we have another anthology installment coming out this June, or at least that's when submissions close, uh, that Ogden is going to come back and tell us more about the island, or rather, the place that it is. Lots of questions were raised here. 
Uh, and not many answers. Seems like he's trying to lead up to 